Hello and welcome to another E5 podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dan Jackson, aka Dan's the Engineer, and I'm joined today with Paul Meenan, aka Paul. You, yeah, you Paul. Hi. There you go. I just don't have that dramatic thing. Um, but there you go. Yeah, I'm Paul. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hope everybody's doing well. We're we're recording this sort of mid lockdown still, so obviously we're in crazy times. And we thought we'd do this podcast and talk about management systems and sort of go through some of that. And obviously, you know, Paul, you're a client, you've you've done contracting, you've got vast knowledge on this topic. So we want to sort of explore a little bit more, find out a little bit more from you. And um, so yeah, first of all, Paul. What is a management system? Okay, so kind of. So first of all, um, just just to clarify, when I was coming off the tools, going into supervisors, as your supervisor, you're a manager of people, and straight away, your brain, you have a fight because you still want to be one of the boys. Okay, so you have to have this conflict with yourself where you you have to level up your behaviours, you have to be able to lead the men, you have to be able to emotionally divorce yourself to an extent. Um, you have to man manage emotionally, manage the people. Some people, you know, will be bad eggs. You have there's a lot you need to do. You need to do more paperwork. So the minute you come off the tools, and and this is kind of what we're talking about really in this one is when you come off the tools and you have to start to do management, you immediately by default go into some form of management system, but your lack of experience and knowledge at that point will not understand any of this. Now I have been on a journey for probably 15 just over 15 years now while i've worked my way through the ranks um, of understanding these management systems and the reason i wanted to understand them was because they were so damn hard and i just rebelled against them because i still wanted to be one of the boys one of the sparks so my kind of annoyance and frustration because i didn't know it i was outside my comfort zone made me rebel but management systems have been around since the 1950s Um, There was a chap um, called W. Edwards Deming um, who was around in the 1950s and he produced something called the Deming cycle, which everybody listening has never heard of. But it's known as the plan, do, check, act system. And that is known more in modern terms as a continuous improvement cycle. And every major company and every company that operates a management system will have to demonstrate that they can continually improve as a business. Um, And that's something maybe the Sparks don't know much about um, or they're learning. But I think we should maybe talk about that today. So, I mean, this is such a broad topic. It is. It is crazy. So, um, I mean, there's so many things we can go on about here. So, obviously, your current role, Paul, Yeah. what is the main focus there in terms of management systems? Okay. Um, So, company I work for at the moment and past companies um, operate management systems. And what that basically means, loads and loads of sparks will have uh, had on their van or seen on a van of a major company a logo that says ISO 9001. That's loads of people see that, the tick, quality management, ISO 9001. Oh my God, your hand's gone. But um, ISO 9001 is probably the most common uh, management system. It's quality management. What that basically means is the company are committing to a level of quality in how their business operates from say if they're an electrical contractor the install all the way through to the board of directors Um, and that quality can be ensuring that they keep records they have procedures they don't have to have loads but they just commit to a minimum amount of procedures and retaining of records reviewing complaints getting feedback and 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 acting upon it that's basically an iso 9001 system um what what the ISO uh, organization did, and ISO, by the way, for those who are unaware of what ISO means, they're the International Organization for Standardization. OK, um, and so they globally produce frameworks or management systems for people to adopt 
on various subject matters. So 9001 is quality. 14,001 um, is uh, environmental. Uh, actually, no, it's changed to 45,001, I believe. Um, 18,001 is occupational health. So if you're at work as a spark and you're suffering from back pain, you're, um, you've got health problems, arthritis developing, if you go to your employer and they're registered under that management system, you should be able to read up in your own time what the requirements are, but more importantly, hold your employers to it because your employers are supposed to maintain and manage your working conditions so there isn't any health issues. Um, then you've got ISO 55,000, which is about energy management. You've then got 31,000, and this is dumb, 31,000 collaboration, collaborative organizations and collaborative supply chain. So the client doesn't screw over the contractor. There's transparency in finances. But my favorite and my day job is ISO 55,000. And ISO 55,000 is the one I kind of want to talk about today. And that is asset management, also known by me as the science of common sense. The science of common sense. The science of common sense. <clears throat> now, um, the people at the IAM, uh, which is the Institute of Asset Management, which are a, 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 an organization I'm a member of, much like the IET, um, they will shoot me for calling it the science of common sense. But for me, as a spark going into management learning this when i first saw it it called to me and it made a lot of sense because it was the it's the most holistic way of making decisions so i've sat on construction sites all the time watching mistake after mistake after mistake made bad management bad decisions bad ideas bad designs bad handovers and i just thought well why are we not thinking big picture and I remember once I met a chap um, and I, he said to me, what do you do? I said, I work in construction and, you know, um, we do, you know, in construction, it's like all cradle to grave. That's a term that they use in management, cradle to grave, which basically when somebody says to you, I want you to deliver a rewire of a house from cradle to grave, it means from start to finish. Yeah. OK. An asset manager has a bit more of a holistic mindset. So an asset manager won't do cradle to grave they'll do a lust to dust. And if you think about the analogy, when a baby's in a cradle, you've got horny, you've made decision, you've done the nine, you've, you, you're committed. Lust to dust is the mindset of thinking about, do I really want to do this? Do I understand the impact of what I'm doing? Do I understand the life, the lifelong financial cost, the risk? You can almost compare it to parenthood to a certain extent. Um, do, I, do I understand that full impact? Um, and then also dust rather than grave. When you put a body in the grave um, and there's Dave jumping straight in. Um, hi, Dave. When you put a body in the grave, there's still a physical thing there. Whereas when when a body has become dust, it's nothing. It blows around on the air. It's completely gone. There's no physical thing to come back or be managed or have to worry about. So I, I'm a big fan of a bigger view a bigger look at things too many people when they have conflict and rouse will talk about one issue uh dave when he's what debating the, what regular... the fuck did i just walk into <laughs> <laughs> by the way listeners um yeah dave um aka sparky ninja has just jumped in on this podcast <laughs> he's uh, yeah we haven't briefed him uh, we're, we're talking about management systems dave oh right yeah, talking about graves so yeah i believe um in taking a bigger look at how we manage things. David, hello David, when David argues about regulations or debates a regulation, he won't just pick up um, the blue book and say, well, if you read that, David will go, well, if you read that, and then you read these supporting documents and the electricity at work regulations and these other standards, you'll build a picture to have a bigger view before you make your decision. And asset management is very much, some people think it's strategic decision making. Some people think it's about risk management. Some people think it's about facilities management and maintenance. It's all of that. It's, it's, it's literally every part of the life cycle of an asset. Now an asset effectively is, is uh, under the standards. Uh, in fact, what we'll do is we'll, we'll I'll, I'll go back and I'll give you a little bit of a history, if you don't mind, um, in asset management, because it's a, it's quite an in-depth subject. Um, to, to the listeners, um, we've just had uh, David Watts, Spark Manager, join, join us. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? I'm all right. 
I've got a coffee. Um, I didn't know you guys were doing a podcast. Oh, hi. All right. You just jumped in. Just you just in. jumped in. And this that's... is how we do these podcasts. There's no scripts. It's just jumping. Why would until... we? Why would we script it? Right. So, yeah. um, under the uh, under the old standard. Um, so when asset management was first uh, came out, there was a standard called PASS, a publicly available specification. And, it, and this was this is the exact term it used. So asset management is the systematic and coordinating activities and practices through which an organization optimally and sustainably manages its assets and asset systems, their associated performance, risks, expenditures over their life cycles for the purpose of achieving its organizational strategic plan. Jesus Christ, that's a lot. Is there that... a shorter version of that? There is a much shorter version of that because most people look at that and go, what does that mean? So they rewrote that. They threw that in the bin and they right. released ISO 55000 standard. <laughs> and asset management in ISO 55000 is the coordinated activity of any organization to realize value from its assets. Uh, That's it. How much, mean, how much of this is financial and how much of this is compliance? Well, compliance is one part of it. So they have um, what they've done is very cleverly um, divvied up um, the way asset management is managed, because I, as an engineer, would be put in the engineering tribe. If I was a maintenance engineer, I'd be in the maintenance engineering tribe. If I was a project manager, I'd be in the project management, project delivery tribe. And what asset management does is try to make everybody realize it tries to allow a business to have a big picture and what I'll do in the YouTube, I'll put a link to a YouTube video called The Big Picture, which talks about tribalism. So and I guarantee you, anyone watching this, if you watch the big picture video, you'll immediately if you work in a medium to large company, you'll immediately see the problems that you suffer in your organization through lack of communication, lack of coordination. So every company under this standard must have a strategic plan, strategic mm -hmm. meaning bloody high level nosebleeds um, under that they should have risk management review, they should have information for their assets, they need to have people to deliver what they need, they need to have strategies, um, and those strategies may be we're going to buy some stuff, we're going to operate some kit, we're going to maintain kit, we're going to remove it and dispose of it, and we're going to use lots of information to inform how we make our decisions. So does this, does this, does this incorporate anyone above an SME or inclusive of SME? So SMEs fit into this. Yeah. So this is why I wanted to record this, because uh, loads and loads of people, they're listening to this game. This does not apply to me. It doesn't apply to me. This really does. But I think from a if I operate a small business, the reason I'm telling people this is I use electrical contractors every day and electrical contractors without them. I can't deliver any of my plans. Mm -hmm. I can't be an asset manager without my supply chain. If my supply chain knew what I knew. They would earn so much more money because they would help me deliver things quicker, better, more effectively, because they would have that mindset. There, Do you know what I mean? There is a big mindset, especially with the electrical industry. You you do a job, you finish it, see you later. That's it. Yeah. And and it's there is a big culture of just quick get it in, get it done, never look at it again. Yep. Yeah. And, so I mean, I mean, how many how many uh, listeners have um, have had clients that come to you with a, a very sketchy specification, more or less along the lines of we just want a few bits here and there, blah blah blah, without going into detail of how it's going to be maintained, how long it's going to last, and that kind of thing. And this and this is the thing: it, every asset management system that a companies operate will always be slightly different. Uh, because it depends on company size, uh, how much money they have, how much they want to improve. Uh, and this is the thing. So my asset management system that I operate in my current job is different from the one I had at the DLR in Transport for London. Um, and that's fine. But what the ISO 55000 is, it's a it's a common framework. And, and I think the um, the correct terminology is a common language for cross functional discussion. So it's a framework of how all these individual parts fit together, coordinate really well and interdepend on each other um, and how they can be managed better using facts, logic, not opinions and stupidity. So are you audited on ISO 55000? Yes. yes. And every year I've had I've had two audits in my current business. Every year the chap comes in and goes, what have you done to improve from where you were last year? 
Yeah. And I say, well, this is what I was last year and this is what I've introduced this year. And this is my vision going forward. And you'll say, well, evidence that. So I will have to have a documented plan of what I want to do. I will have to have evidence of works that I've delivered. Um, he will take a holistic view. Um, and this is why I did auditing for a while. He will take a holistic view of all the parts of our team and our business and say, you're you're getting there. Your your knowledge and your understanding, your awareness. It's like the wiring regulations. An electrician, when you first start in college, you learn hopefully the fundamental principles, but eventually as you emerge and develop and grow your applied knowledge and you have rows and debates, you will immediately go, oh yeah, I know what chapter 54 <clears throat> is, earth and bonding. I know, uh, you know, what section 705 is. I know because you've used it, you've developed and emerged your competence. It's the exact same of asset management systems. The only difference is asset management system doesn't allow, uh, allow silo thinking. It acknowledges tribes and it says, well, if you've got these tribes, all these tribes need to input into a common framework. And the common framework is it's actually known as the, the scope or the asset management landscape. But within that, they have uh, something called a six box model and they're just colorful boxes. Yeah. But within those six boxes, they have what is known as 39 steps. And you have to look at your business and say, do I do demand analysis? Do I do planning? Do I do uh, capital investment decision making? Do I do operations and maintenance decision making? I know I have to maintain, but do I stop and think about what I need to maintain, the frequency, the level of compliance? But more importantly, do I listen to my maintenance tribe and the maintenance tribe go, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is all failing. This is all awful. It's Life is crap. We need more money. Aha. If they need more money, why do they need more, need, need more money? Because maybe the electrics are knackered. OK, what's the cost to the business of not investing more money? Am I at risk of non-compliance? Maybe. Am I at risk of operational impact, which is reputational damage? You know, aggro for the board. So is it worth spending 150 grand extra per year to bring us into compliance? Do I not have the money? Do I need to maybe sweat my assets, which is basically don't maintain them, do the minimum for statutory, but kind of run them to failure? Because sometimes that can also be a plan. As long as you accept that plan and the impact of what you've done. And all parts of the business must go on that collaborative journey together. My experience in the food industry is a bit like that in that they adjust them. I mean, fundamentally, productivity, you know, productivity is key, but then they'll they'll pull back and they'll pull back and they'll pull back on maintenance and all those expenses until they just get to compliance. But often what they do then is they don't look forward or they don't protect themselves from moving forward. And this is the thing. If you had a business, say, of six people and each one was given a task. So, for instance, one group, one person could be responsible for risk and review, which is a criteria. That person would be responsible for risk assessment of management and management, not just tasks, but corporate risk. Mm. They would then look at contingency planning, resilience. They would look at sustainability. They would look at how we manage change. They would look at asset performance. They would maybe look at monitoring. They would look at the asset management system and how they monitor it. They would look at other management systems, audit, assurance, how we do costing, how we value the worth of our business and how we engage with people around us. And, and that's just one of the six framework tools that we have to have considered and documented and communicated. And by doing that, what you find is it actually does start to work because it changes people's behaviours. It changes the way people look at stuff and it gives people ownership. And I've never seen a management system which I haven't just frowned upon with the exception of this. You know, there's a section on procurement, supply chain management. So the risk guy could turn around and say, well, if we keep procuring the way we do, we're just going to end up with crap, which is going to put our risk business and corporate risk really high. And we're not going to be able to financially forecast does, because the procurement guys are getting it wrong. Does procurement really focus on compliance or quality of compliance over no, cost? No, but, but remember what this asset management system does is it allows the business to take a, 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 a look at every tribe yeah, and figure view. out how, how one tribe's bad performance affects the rest of the tribes. And it allows them, this is why I call it the science of common sense, because if you're procuring something which leads to reworks, which leads to any, um, let's say you plan to have a million pound profit in your business every year, but the cost of rework from poor procurement costs you 1.1. Well, normally it just becomes a row and a debate. 
In an asset management system, it becomes objective, recorded, assessed and audited. And an independent report says, this is why you're hemorrhaging money. And then the board go, oh, yeah, didn't think of it like that because they're too busy in their day job. And so asset management is also not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. Asset management, the reason I call it science of common sense is at the moment in my current job, I'm not making decisions for me. I'm making decisions for the life of an asset. So if I decide to rip out some trunking on a railway platform, yeah, and a perfect example will be Leon C. So Leon C is literally right next to the seaside. If I rip out a load of galve trunking, that galve trunking's probably been there 10 years. Do I want to pay all of the enhanced costs in 10 years time to replace it? No, I want to select and erect Appendix 5 external influences, salt mist deposits. So I'm either going to go with a GRP, non-corrosive, or a stainless steel 316. Why? Because my day job, I won't have to worry because that will sit there happily and resist external influences. But more importantly, I know I'm going to get a guaranteed life. It will cost me more, but it costs me less in the long term. But there might be a plan to do the opposite in some situations. If um, yes, but you have to be really clever if you're going to do that. And you have to know all of the risks you inherited and you also have to document it. Because yeah. otherwise you're not discharged. So it's like me saying, I'm not going to maintain my electrics. Really? Good luck writing that risk assessment that says you don't have to do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to maintain my plant and machinery. So I'm not putting my staff near it then, or I'm putting enhanced control measures. And it just doesn't, it, ne it never works. It never works. Some companies though, and I'll tell you where, water frameworks, they will run assets to failure. Because that's okay. in their contract. They'll install a pump. The pump will only last five years, so it's cheap. And then in five years' time, the client will pay them to renew it because the client only has a five-year contract with them. And some clients are happy with that because it keeps the day-to-day -day cost cheap. It doesn't do anything for the life of the asset. Years ago, you know, we're, we're of an age now where we all know that cars were built years ago to last longer. Now a car after five to eight years is pretty much due to be replaced. Yeah. That's why he's um, runs out. Asset management is the opposite of consumerism if done well. Yeah, and it, it, well, it allows you to predict the future, doesn't it? It allows you to predict and monitor um, and, and, you know, record so, as you go. So under, the, under this one section called life cycle delivery, you have to, in that one section, consider, and this is where the engineers fit well, technical standards and legislative impact. If the standards change, so for instance, BS7671, has changed, 18th edition. As an asset manager, I'm, oh, there you go, look, it's white, it's blue. So as an asset manager, I'm gonna laugh at that because all I'm gonna wanna know from my engineering tribe is, what's the cost impact to me? Do I actually have to comply? Do I have to rip out all my stuff from my railway? What's the impact on me? So you do an impact assessment. The flip um, side of that is whenever yeah. the 18th breaks come out, all my clients in the food industry or that go, all of that's great, but does it apply to my guys? Does it apply to my teams? Well, and if there's to... nothing in there that applies to them, they won't be interested. You have to do this. So when the 18th edition came out, you know, I looked at arc fault detection. So mm. under the arc fault standard, it doesn't, they don't work. They haven't got the pollution category. So I can't use arc fault detection. And I really wouldn't anyway on a railway. Um, so the only thing I can do is, is uh, ensure I've got the immunity on my breakers. Other than that, it's not really any change uh, to go on view. If it does require mandated change, I need to understand the cost impact to my railway. Because if I, if, if the aim edition says you will put these devices in everywhere, there may be more maintenance costs, there may be more energy costs. I can then choose whether I adopt this standard or not. As long as my assets give me the operation and safety I need as a business to comply with legislation, these are still guidance notes. And this is where the non-technical managers get frowned upon. But um, the engineers will do systems engineering, looking holistically, configuration maintenance, maintenance delivery, reliability. You can assess something to the nth degree to see how long the products and the components will work and how they're all integrated. Resource management, do I have enough people to do the job? Shutdown, outage management, fault and instant report. How do you do your reviews? How do you decommission an asset and make sure it's disposed to where five years time it doesn't come back and bite you? Sellafield, nuclear waste repository. They're an asset management organization. They are taking nuclear waste from decommissioned cellar field and they are taking specially made containers and basically they bring it in on the back of like a, a lorry. They drop all the radiated nuclear waste in, fill it with a specially designed and made concrete, 
drive it off to a field and bury these containers three deep in this football field and just cover it in in earth so in a thousand years 500 years time there may be a, a, an ongoing cost there because eventually that metal may corrode but it's still entombed so eventually there could be an, a, a decommissioned asset that still has a, a cost legacy to it yeah, i suppose um you could apply that to um the electrical grid yeah of course and i know yeah. when you're going to sell it well, I know people in National Grid, and I know I'll probably get shot for saying this, but National Grid is anyone who knows anything, and Sparks especially do on the DNO intakes. National Grid is, uh, especially the DNO side of it, is shot. They're old. There is no way in hell this country would want to spend the money to upgrade the supplies. And they did in the 70s, and it was called PME supplies. And look at the problems we've got with that. You know, when they started putting PME in, it was the great, you know, hope. And now all we've got is lost pen conductors not the greatest yeah. thing in the world um but yeah so asset management is for anyone listening who's maybe interested in iso standards there's always three parts to every iso one is the overview which is like terms and definitions the um 9001 or 14001 or whatever number and one is always the requirements that's what you're audited against and then the 55002 or 9002 is the guidance note <coughs> um, and there are lots right. of guidance notes for asset management so for the sparky who's sitting this to this, listening yeah, to this sorry. in his van, yeah. what oh, can he do no. first? What can he do first? What's the first step? So my, my you're, you're, you're bang on. So what my I've always said to the guys is if you can start to understand these 39 steps. So I within my asset management system, I have to do 39 basic checks. If you can understand what I need or, or where they contribute to those 39 steps, they then will adapt their thinking and help me be better at what I do mm -hmm. rather than just say, go and pay me to change the socket. Yeah. yeah well, you, you, they, they can make your life easy. And they then can you, help then me. You, then you I, can say, have some more money. So here's the science of common sense. They can help me identify risk better just by following the wiring regulations. Yeah. Wow. Trust me, it's a struggle. <laughs> I'm telling you now. But they can almost, I'm not saying write their own blank check, but they can almost um, identify, if I say go out and do this and they go, I can do that, but I've identified X, Y, and Z, the impact is your, um, you won't be able to do, shut, you won't be able to work on it unless you shut down the whole railway station. Yeah. Hmm, don't really want to do that. I'd like to reconfigure it so I can have, I want to be able to shut my railway stations down and still sell tickets, Dave. Hmm. So I, I might need to want to reconfigure my systems. And now if somebody can think about how I um, configure my electrical distribution systems, that's someone who's of use to me, especially if my electrical systems are life expired. Collaborate with Paul. Yes, indeed. Collaborate. So even though they're a contractor, they're, they're, you're working together with the bigger picture. Yeah. Forward. And there are six, in fairness, there are six, there are six stages to asset management in the journey you go on learning. So the first part of it is you're you're innocent, you're learning. The next stage is you're aware of it. So after this, everybody will, will be aware there's a, a management system called ISO 55000 and um, clients are growing and developing and emerging in their implementation of this. Now, remember, these management systems will be past all of our careers. Yeah, yeah. This is something past the individual. Um, this is the corporate system that lasts and develops and grows and changes so at the moment with coronavirus all asset management systems are going to have to change they're going to have to because this is uh effectively almost a, a force majeure in contracts it's a almost a a, a, a vent of godlike proportions that nobody could have predicted to an extent well, because so, you well because you have to change your strategy well you have to straight change your investment pattern you have to yeah i may have to invest millions more in cleaning and disinfecting and changing the way my stations are uh, configured i may have to do more to protect my staff well, I, I mean any company that runs a safe policy if they're essential workers as well yeah there's going to have to have a documented system of work strategy to show how they will assure that their workers are safe yeah yet obviously still instructed to work as essential workers yeah so you know a lot of that we, we mentioned this a few weeks ago a lot of that hasn't been written down before but now needs to be written yes and in fairness, some of my contractors um, have actually within a week have sent me updated RAMs with coronavirus, mm. um, social distancing, some common sense stuff. But the work we're doing, we're making sure that they are 
cop they are socially distancing now yeah. with asset management the organization has to go on a journey where they're going to have to change the way they think when they adopt this mindset this is a long term uh, the organization has to develop its activities it then has to embed them it then has to become business as usual and every little tribe needs to understand they contribute to a picture bigger than their own egos their own self i have genuinely found this to be the one true asset management system that overrides personalities not in respects of passion but keeps it factual evidence based risk based paperwork based mm. and is just why again i call it the science of common sense because it genuinely is to me. Yeah. There you go. So, um, what as a client? Yeah. What would you expect from a contractor that you get on board to fit in line with, obviously, your asset management system? Um, okay, so very simple. If you're going to do work for an asset manager client, be prepared to do um, more paperwork than the minimum, or at least get your minimum paperwork right. Um, so for me, I, if I ask an electrical contractor to do something on my railway, what I want is a, a quote from them, uh, preferably a quote with photos in it that shows me that they've actually gone out and looked at the damn job. Um, I then, when they've done the work, I expect the electrical installation certificate or any drawings that we're required as built. Um, and also a little closeout report that shows the before and the after, what they did. There's my certificate, there's my drawing, job done. Because it becomes a record where I can then put that with the money I spent and also ensure that the next person who goes to work on it, I can say, by the way, that lighting column, I replaced it five years ago. This is what it was like for. This is what it was like when the, we left it. Th that sounds like really basic stuff, though, Paul. Is, it is people basic not stuff. Um, no. Most contract, you go onto a lot of railways, you go onto a lot of companies and say, where's all your management systems and your records? People are too busy creating these online document systems that... They try and hoover up decades of paperwork that nobody's managed. And yeah. yet 20, 30 years ago, you would go to a clerk of works. The clerk of works would be the one to issue you the drawing. You would take the drawing. It would be yours, signed out and issued back. Modern industry, thanks to IT, has lost the management controls that human beings had. And human beings used common sense. It's I the, own um, the drawing. I own the master. <clears throat> And we'll change it. You will that's upgrade. the same. That's the same with health and safety systems and work and rands and method statements. Yep. Everything's pre-written, template, autonomous nonsense. Yes. You know, and many times the person doing the actual work has never actually assessed the risk or written the document or understood the instructions. Yeah. Now, to, to those listening, it's probably worth saying as well that asset management, in the context of what I'm saying, is is it's a normal language in mm -hmm. uh, national grid generation transmission distribution infrastructure water renewables and transport so if you want to grow your business in that nuclear um if you want to grow your businesses in that this is the document you need to read to understand the wants and needs of your client um i've said this to the eca because the eca actually have done um two or three years ago uh, like um, events in London yeah. where they actually talk to their contracts about understanding asset management and what it is um, so that they can be better service providers to their clients. It's like they've got that ERAMS thing, haven't they? I've never yeah. I've never looked at it, actually. Is it yeah. any good? Um, it's one grams. I just, I just don't like things that pre-write your risk assessments for you. No, I don't. I I'd, don't rather, like I'd rather write it on a one-pager and it'd be yeah. specific. Um, it, it, to, saves, it saves time, but then it's like um, it's I like anything like that should save time, though, in my personal view. Yeah, and, well, that's the thing because obviously, what happens is a lot of the time that I've seen is people just copy and paste. Yeah, but they do that anyway. A lot of time they do that anyway with um, you know if it's not some cloud-based system, um, and you know you, you just copy and paste from the last job, and it, a lot of the time it has um, even site information. <laughs> from the last yeah. place it's copied from and yeah, no, i've seen it before i've seen um i've seen <clears throat> risk assessments with the actual um watermark of the company they bought it from on the internet it's still on there um, wow you know and you just change your name or change your job number and it's generic because you know there's nothing you can tell because there's nothing unique or specific relative to the nature of the job That's so cool. If anyone was wondering how they got into asset management, I mean, I've said this to many people. Uh, I think I've probably said it to you guys as well. There are two qualifications you can do. There is a certificate in asset management, which is a level three. And there's a diploma in asset management, which I believe is a level five now, maybe six. 
Um, I've done both. They were the two hardest courses I've ever done because there were nothing to do with earth loop impedances or 7671 or any other British standards. And it was it was about how would you invest given all the data you're given? What decisions would you make here? What does the criteria in the ISO standard state? Can you can you do a whole life cost model? So here's an interesting one for you. And this is this is what I actually did for my diploma. So fire alarm panel, Kentec, one detector, one uh, call point in a room. I think I mentioned this in the previous podcast in a room on a railway platform. Um, I think it cost uh, I worked out over 15 years, something like one hundred and seventy thousand pound. Now, how do I do a whole life cost? Well, I look at the cost of the panel. I look at the uh, the cost of maintenance every month, year, quarterly. So I, I add up the cost of two engineers access equipment van fuel i i do all the averages uh, i then add inflation per year so i create a spreadsheet with all of these things i could send you a copy of a one that i've got um and then you look at the cost of a fire alarm panel to procure how much it would cost to rip it out and dispose uh, upgrading the software so you allow for like a critical failure because it's you know it's peaked after seven years and you might have had a system of software failure so you allow for the worst case scenario mm. so I worked out 170 grand for a fire alarm panel with one smoke and one detector in a brick building where if it caught fire, it wouldn't actually stop the railway. Now, 170,000 pound over 15 years could be spent on something far better. And this is this is where pragmatic application of do you realize how much this will cost against it's this is stupid as saying go into your shed and put an ACO fire alarm system in nothing against ACO and hardwire it into your house and do all this the cost of it and the cost to maintain it and keep it up and power it up and all the energy costs and going out and paying someone to maintain it, keep a logbook, it adds up to serious money. And asset management, they kind of make you think about every single aspect of how to manage that asset from acquiring it, disposing of it, energy costs, cost to maintain, cost to access, everything. And it's it's a great mindset. So you're, you, there are two qualifications you can get. There are seven competencies within the framework um, from strategy all the way through delivery of you know, renewals and enhancements. There's the six box model uh, within the six box model is the 39 asset management subjects. There's self assessment methodologies and there's also um, white papers, good practice, subject specific guidance notes, which you can buy and download, which give you case studies of businesses. So I'd love to see. Uh, a case study of a company who had to apply a really awkward part of chapter 54. Um, well, the IAM actually do do that. They they nationally get together twice a year and they have companies all around the world talk about how difficult it is to implement a management system. Fascinating stuff to be honest with you, because what it does for me is it makes me better at making my electrics better and hopefully helping my contractors. Um, I just wish that contractors would maybe come on that journey as well, grow their business, as Dan says, develop my business, understand the concepts of what asset management is. You will be a better. It's like being able to read my mind, isn't it? There's the electrical manager in that tribe. He's the asset manager as well. I understand what he wants. Um, I've been out, had a look. Um, there's money to be made here, but it's got to be in a way that aligns with his vision, corporate goals, business strategies, cost and spend profile. We've really got, gone off electrics now. I apologise if everyone's completely bored and not switched off. <laughs> um, but it's a different mindset. Yeah. Um, and then when, when you look at the electrical industry, you then look down, at, not down at it, but you look at it and you just go, right, look at all these badges. Look at all these badges. I mean, I work with people. I remember one day I worked with a lady, wonderful woman called Hannah. And she turned around to me and said, what are all these badges in the electrical industry? I went, what do you mean? And, and I'll never forget it. And she went, well, what are they all? And I said, well, it's JRB, there's ECA, there was Stroma, there was NAPIT, there was NIC, ECA, um, Spark Safe. And, and she was like, what do they all do? And that was when, I don't even remember on social media, I published a little picture of some offer individual registration, like Spark Safe and the JRB. Some represent the contractor, some represent the trade association. And, and her, her message to me was, yeah, but who represents the clients? Who looks, uh, who looks out for the client's interests? Because and I went, well, the kind of these, I was like, no, the ECA don't because uh, they represent the contractor who want to make money from the clients. Um, but Spark Safe, they ain't got into with clients. Yes, the IET do to an extent, the ECA do to an extent. 
NAPIT do to an extent, but how much do they actually do to understand the mindset of a client? Now, some guys who are domestic installers, house bashers, they would just go, well, my clients are wankers because they just want cheap, cheap, cheap. And and yes, this podcast is definitely for the commercial industrial type of people. This is, I probably should have yeah. said that at the start. Sorry. But um, it's a fascinating world um, because it gives you a different way of looking. I mean, you know, um, I, I've always said that the industry bodies, um, if I look at the NIC or NAPIT, um, just within the 39 mod, uh, steps, they will look at technical standards and legislation. They help with procurement and supply chain management, risk assessment, contingency planning, sustainability, asset performance, because who knows better about electrical assets than the industry bodies, uh, management reviews, audits, um, you know, uh, shutdown and outage strategies, operations and maintenance. So straight away, there's 10 of the 39 that the electrical industry bodies do or know or, or are considered experts at, but we just don't plug those gaps but do those do they actually do those for you uh, they they do them for if you were going to go to someone and ask about shutdowns and outages you could probably go to say the nic and the nic would probably say well we can actually run a course for you on what the impact is for you they can develop stuff because anyone who's worked in the electrical industry should be able to grasp an understanding of how to do a shutdown how to because it's effectively safe isolation on a far bigger scale because it's withdrawing many, many uh, pieces of equipment from use, you know, de-energizing an entire system. Um, it's it's kind of our bread and butter stuff, but it's it's rather than taking it from the spark, looking up at the at the items, it's taking it from I own all this kit. Who do I get to do this really well? Somebody needs to be able to plug the two together, and if the contractors realise where they fit better, I genuinely think it will make the relationships better. Too many contractors we hear are falling out, bad payment terms, this, that and the other. I think this is one small thing. And don't get me wrong, it's not a perfect system. Um, I genuinely think the, the application, this is down to the passion of the people who want to use it and be good. Um, in my job, I always keep, even though I'm really passionate and I'm a lunatic, I, when people say to me, oh, you want stainless steel and GRP? I go, no, 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 no. The requirements are 7671 and good selection and erection and good whole life costing mandate we should be selecting and erecting it correctly which would be stainless steel because i'm on a coastal location or i'm grp um and it takes that personality away from it it makes it just the science of common sense and that's how i've always looked at asset management so for me i would say to contractors develop your knowledge maybe adapt the way your business speaks behaves maybe look at how you can tailor your systems and services um maybe uh Maybe send some of your best guys, your technical guys on a certificate, develop them, CPD, you know, give them a career path where they can think bigger um, or, or get get them in to do a, a half day briefing um, and forget cradle to grave. If someone says to me, oh, yeah, mate, I'll do cradle to grave. Think big, think bigger. Lust to dust, not cradle to grave. The concept of thinking, comparing the two should hopefully give you there's a bigger mindset there. Um, but yeah. Dave's stunned. Dave's just like, oh, I'm just like, that must be a cradle grave thing. Must be something you said before I got onto the podcast. Yes. Yes. So that was a start. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's taken a job start to finish. Yes. Um, But it's not finished because asset management makes you think, do I even need to start it? And what are the reasons why I start it? And do I Mm -hmm. have the long term ability to sustain what I've started? Mm -hmm. So, how can a contractor approach a client, like an existing client or even a new client, client? to try to get this information from them to allow them to find ways to help that client. So, contractors are experts at it because contractors are part of that expert tribe that clients desperately need. What happens is they go in and it's cheap clash, cheap clash. They've all been screwed over. There's no trust. Mm-hmm. There's no rapport. In most contracts, there's a line item in commercial industrial contracts called, and it says um, this contract will be delivered in the spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. And immediately people are fighting. Right. So what I would do as, a, as a, an electrical contractor is I would try and understand the knowledge of what ISO 55000 is. I would then map it into what I do and offer as a contractor. So I'm a panel builder or I offer BMS. So how can my BMS offer better life cycle modeling? How can it offer? Um, can I maybe say, well, I do I do BMS, but if I connect it into Internet of Things, I can provide far more data 
to allow them to make better asset management decisions. I suppose it's better. like um, it's like installing a Schneider panel or installing a Schneider paddle with power tag. It's exact. Believe it or not, that's the it was the most simple, easy decision I have ever done because it was like uh, I need to replace a number of consumer units. There's new technology out there. I want to install a robust product that's compliant for the pollution category. So I'm not I'm not installing a domestic style board. I went with the Schneider 60947-2s and the power tax were, oh, monitor the energy of individual circuits. That's interesting. Well, what can that do for me? Well, first of all, so here's this for, I can spend 10 grand on a new board. And when the power trips, my station's in darkness, staff have to ring up. Um, there's a whole host of problems, waiting hours. With these new boards, if the power trips, immediately tells my maintainer get your backside out there so i've saved five minutes of downtime that five minutes about downtime can be 20 grand for a railway in operational terms even more yeah okay so um then there's they're taking the human failure of reporting the wrong thing because it tells me exactly what has tripped i then have the ability to detect when my break my circuits are going to trip before they do because you can set um peaks so if i if i want to i can set an mcb to when it goes above 80 percent of the breaker so i've got 10 amp light and circuit if it goes above eight amps it will email me and say can you please come out and have a look yeah now it's over like a, time like pre-alarm yeah over time i'm actually getting all this trend of data and there's two things it's told us one in the first six months from installing the first board i had about 250 emails and what mm -hmm. that also told me is when the guys went out i had a number of old connected assets which were failing this was this was just as an indirect thing picking up on assets that were failing because the load profile was changing so for instance a battery mounted ups for instance for a comms rack was pulling more energy because the fans were being blocked it was picking up on all of this stuff any maintenance that weren't done it was it was giving me a level of in intelligence i didn't expect from it but more importantly one thing this has taught me massively is in i've got a 12-way three-phase board okay so not 12 18 way three phase board and i've got circuits on it that over the last year that i've had this intelligence have pulled power for maybe two minutes a week on certain loads but okay you think of conduit single core cables fixed appliances labor costs um space all of the issues that come with trying to manage that I could easily ditch, and I, I know this, um, I could ditch probably 40% of all the circuits I've ha I have and combine them in existing circuits because I understand the load and the energy profile, which then changes the rules of the game because I've now got less cost to renew my infrastructure, but evidence to justify that I don't need to have a dedicated radial for every single thing. And you could probably... You could probably save on the cost of upgrading your wiring system as well if you can actually recycle it and actually remove existing systems. Then you've got, you know, you don't need, you don't need to uh, fill it up. So and, there's and there's value. It. That is value to a client. There may be a big uh, front end, but the difference in, I mean, for us, for instance, we we now got a number of smart boards installed. Um, we've got cloud systems. For us, it's it's totally changed the game because we're seeing we're seeing us using technology and technology informing us on how to be better. And does does that data belong to you as the client, or could yes. I, as a contractor, have no. a maintenance contract with you and and, and no. monitor so the data I've, for you? No, so I pay I for, I pay for that product. I pay for everything that comes from that product. Um, they are just and, and the thing is as well when we okay, what, what if I offered it as a, as a maintainer service? That's not how my contracts work. I will what, ask, if I, what if I was to go elsewhere and do that? Is that workable? Uh, you could go and work wherever you want, but you don't. You'll get very much work. Um, the, the, it, you can't. You if you try and hold something over a client, the client will say do one. You're, I want you to come in and provide me this service. And and if if you want to maintain you should, it, fine. You should you should you should, you should see the uh, you should see what some of the companies right now are doing with test data. Oh really? Yeah, big <sighs> big ones, big ones, Sheffield area. No, on, on railways, if you do a piece of work for the railway, unless the railway ask you to maintain it, um, it's their equipment. You've been paid to install it and commission it. The client will benefit from it. I have an incumbent maintainer already. So I will I will pay my maintainer 
uh, or do a process called entry into service and handback where I, I energize the board, I will train my maintainer, they will then be used to working on these new systems. In all fairness, the value for me is paying the maintainer to do the board change. Mm. Because I don't have to then engage in that process. And that's just reducing the layers of stupidity. Um, but I, my maintainer can maintain them. System. If I want, for instance, I'm, I'm going to be renewing my fire alarm systems and I'm going to have smart equipment on my fire alarm systems that automatically populate logbooks. I can choose to withhold that information from my maintainer if I want. It's an mm -hmm. assurance tool for me. So I have yeah, the but, option. Yeah. A, lot, but a, lot, a lot of clients won't be interested in actually themselves having that data. They'd want but someone else. No, 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 that's where you're wrong because the clients will be because on fire alarms, they'll see that as a statutory compliance item. Having fire alarm data is essential. I was talking about fire alarm. Hey? I was talking about fire alarm. I was talking about these power sorry. tags. Oh, sorry, mate. Yeah, power tags. No, um, uh, for me, this is about understanding our load profile, our energy usage, how going forward we can make our costs uh, demonstrate better value by reducing the number of circuits while still not impeding safety. Mm. So that's that's where I'm I'm going with it. It's quite exciting times. Oh, it's a good. It's a great thing. The problem is how you know. It's, well, not not really a problem. It's so many. So many clients for low electricians, they'd want to introduce this technology. Yeah. And they want to hopefully maybe help maintain and get, you know, they want to show the clients what the technology can do and they'll want to help the client maintain it and they'll want access or they'll want that, you know, they'll want that interaction to carry on. So you know. one of the things that I've always said is when a contractor's out doing works, we use the code, a well, lot, I say we don't use code, we use coding. Yeah. Now, that's the minimum. The wine rigs is the minimum. So I, I, I actually produced uh, years ago when I was electrical contracting an, uh, uh, an asset condition defect form. And I'd come up with like seven categories where like a category A would say asset has no damage. All the labels are there. It's clean, it's secure. It operates as per the original spec. There's at least 10 years left in it. Doesn't require an overhaul. I would then put a code if it was applicable. I'd, 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 I'd have it like a column. So in the column, I'd say C3, C2 or not applicable. Yeah. I then quote the regulation. I mm -hmm. then say, is there a legal breach? And then what the risk is, low, medium and high. Mm -hmm. So if my contractor are going out and saying, right, we've got a number of assets where there are code E, let's say, and a code E may have, say requires immediate replacement or major overhaul. It's a C3 as far as code breaking is concerned. It's a breach of seven or seven or eight regs. It's a breach of provision and use of workplace equipment. Do you know what I mean? You've then got all of these sources of information allowing you to make an informed decision. The yeah. contractor that goes with more than the minimum is the one that will open the eyes of the client because then the clients will go, these guys know what they're doing. So how do we get clients to want to open their eyes to this? Because um, here's the problem. Teach it's like I've got the code of practice here and every time I train people, I say it's more than that. I'll mention, you just mentioned pure. If yeah. we look at equipment that's not going to have a suitable, you know, life, if the life is going to diminish due to its use, its demand, its location, whatever, you know, we need to hand that to the client and give the client that information. Yeah. They don't know that a they lot don't, of clients know. don't want to know. And, and in fairness, I'm, I'm, I, I consider myself very fortunate and privileged because I've been able to use my sparking knowledge, my engineer knowledge, my safety knowledge, which I've developed through my own want to do CPD. Hmm. And I've gone I've gone in fixed bayonets sometimes saying, nope, sorry, we're not doing this. We've got an obligation. Um, I, I have regularly had to sit down with my some of my colleagues and do a little CPD session where I've had to say, look, this is this is the provision and use of workplace regs. Or I actually had to do a little briefing on um, surge protection the other day where I was talking to my colleagues about surge protection and why we do it and the impact of, of not doing it and protection of the assets. And the minute I realized, they realized that all, oh, all this kit that blows up or melts or fails, this could prevent that, which means less work, less cost. Aha. It, it, you can inspire the non-technical to appreciate the technical. But at some point that has to sit with someone who has a level of technical knowledge, who's willing to impart and share that and maybe even make some cost proposals. Yeah, the communication it's a leap, skills. It's a leap of faith from the contractors. Yeah, From my experience, often they'll contact people like myself after the fact there's been an electric shock there's yep. been a near fire they then want some third party to get involved that third party will go and, and i'll say where's your systems 99 then, we'll then we'll start to work on building up Dave, a system. you and i both know 99 percent of most 
knee jerks in management is react after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Asset management is about understanding the level of risk you have from your physical infrastructure. If you understand the level of risk, you will have someone saying we're at risk of a incident, an accident, an entrapment, an electric shock, a fire. That then should inform the board to intervene and ensure that the management systems are evolved and developed to ensure that doesn't happen. And there should be someone clever going, well, if you don't do it, it's going to cost you 150 grand to get Spark and Injury and Co. to come and change the whole business. If you do it now, it will cost us X amount um, and it will be cheaper and better value and will be seen as legally compliant. And, and there's that's less likely to be any penalties as well. Most companies tend to pay attention when you talk about statutory compliance and the impact of fines, fees and costs. That's how to get the attention of the board. And I've always said to contractors, um, if you're ever pricing for a client, discharge your duty in your costing. They will oh, pay yeah. attention. Yeah, I do the um, I do a lot of work, and one of the my, one of the key clients I've worked with for probably about five or six years now. Nasty electric shock incident. I got involved developing a low voltage electrical safety rules procedure, but it went up, and it was the main guy, the main head guy of the company. This company has fifty odd factories. Every other policy the company has had, they've kind of been yeah, whatever. But because it went up to the board. And his name was on it. All health and safety attended. All of the factory management attended, and it actually worked. Yeah. And then, uh, then they started looking at getting him to get onto other policies because you know there was just if the board got onto it, people can be the biggest enablers of change if they choose to be. Um, yeah. For me, culture change. I've always called it the attitude, uh, the ABBA effect. I don't mean the band. I mean attitude, I'm behavior, ABBA. agenda. So yeah. I've always said every meeting I've ever gone into. There's always attitudes, there's always different behaviours, and there's always yeah. an agenda. The We've always done it this way is a cancer. Um, and if people have always done it that way, they're more than likely to sit in a comfort zone and continue to do it that way. By using your knowledge, your legislative, authoritative uh, uh, way you communicate and discharge your duty and offer value, that will either open their eyes or put them asleep. A lot of people have been yeah. put to sleep by this. Some will go, ah, OK, this is a consistent improving journey that my business may want to go on. And I'll be, I say, I've said this to many people, the best thing you can do with your best engineers and your senior managers, put them on an asset management certificate and you will learn over a five day period, the mindsets and the commercial and financial and risk appetites that clients have, the good ones, not the cowboy Yahoo merchants. And that's probably my advice for anyone who wants to level up to do asset management or management systems. Hmm. Any other okay. questions, or have I melted your brain? <laughs> no, it's it's food for thought. There's a lot. It's exciting because there's so much to it. To yeah, which I'll, what I'll probably yeah. have to do is I'll have to do a video as well, where I sit with it behind me and explain all this, so I show the six box model and all the rest of it, because this is one I can actually do. Um, so I should probably just do like a maybe two ten minute videos where I just okay. explain. Look, these are the subjects. Yeah. These are the books. These are this. Go away and read yourself. This is not something you can. This is something you have to go on your own journey of understanding. When I did my training, they sowed the seeds. And then I remember after my certificate, I said to one of the tutors, this is the science of common sense. And he went, it's an interesting way I put it. And I went, but it is. It's the logic behind making the right decisions rather than the personality-based decisions. And he went, well, yeah, because there's sufficient criteria for you to be able to build a case to make that right decision. Mm. That's why I like it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've I've found um I found a lot of times that as a contractor or as a consultant, when I go to a customer, if, if the first thing I try to do is get an understanding of what is <clears throat> valuable to them. Yeah. You know, if we go if we go in with our technical wizardry and our knowledge and we just give them a whole load of bad news, bad news, non compliance, bad news, we're not doing them any help, but we, we need to apply some of that. Yeah, but at the same time, we have to have that great understanding of trying to get a, get an understanding on what is essential for that client. You know that you know continuity of service. You know, you mentioned you got to still sell tickets. Yeah, you know, so these little things, these little things are but, key. But, and so there's a tip for you. So if you're a contractor and you go in and go, oh, this is crap, this is crap, this is rubbish, this is rubbish, la la la, it's going to cost you a lot. You're going to switch every client off. If Definitely. you walk into a contractor and say. I've identified a corporate risk 
And that risk is operational, it's financial, uh, it's reputational, and it can be quite damaging. What do you mean? Well, I found uh, one of your larger main distribution panels um, where I've got what would be known as a C2, um, where there's evidence of thermal effects. And if that fails, you're going to take out half of your manufacturing plant, um, which means you'll stop production. So what's the cost of stopping production for an hour? You then engage in a debate where you take them on a journey where they all agree with you. You then turn around and say, well, I've got the ability and the manpower to do it over weekends. Here's an outline cost. Um, this is just based on I need to do a bit more work. But what do you think? There's not one person in that room will disagree with you. No, they won't. Yeah. And, and, and that, I think, is my final tip for this, to be honest with you. <laughs> Dan got so emotional, he went away and just had a little yeah. sob. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, I, it was too much. I had to go and cry in the corner. No, my um, one of my children just woke up. So, oh, God bless. <laughs> Did you say to you, Daddy, why is there an E5 logo behind you? <laughs> she didn't come in the room, actually. But yeah, oh, bless us all. Dave, you need to update your Skype. Uh, yeah, okay. I've... Okay, chaps, and um, we've done an hour. It's probably time to wind this down. Um, any other questions? Final thoughts? No. Um, did you reference some? documents earlier on are you going to put links to them oh yeah free, um, or... i will put links in but um if you're going to start this journey of learning thank you dave there is something called the iam institute of asset management anatomy it's a right. free to download guide imagine if the regs were free eh? Mm. and it's the it's the simple introduction to the terms that we've discussed the six box model the 39 steps the benefits of an asset management system so it's called the iam anatomy if you can download that and just read it three or four times, you'll be well on your way to being an asset manager because the ISO 55000 is a, it's effectively a framework, a tick box against doing the assessment. But the knowledge is free, a lot of it. You just got to go on the journey, do the work. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Dan, ready to finish it? Or am I yes. <laughs> I'll finish it. I started off. Yeah, you started. Did, 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 Stan, did Dan start this podcast? He did. I did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so, yeah, this this for me, um, I think I think a, some people will take a lot from this, Paul. Um, some it will mean nothing to. Yeah, apologies for that. Apologies. So um, hopefully it's um, interesting. Obviously, um, get in touch, anybody, if you have any questions about any of the topics this goes on youtube it goes on all our social media anyway and that's what we like we like to start discussions yes and like you know paul's thing here he's basically saying go away and do your own research which is important so yeah we're going to finish this off um hope you enjoyed this one guys and uh look after yourself and each other bye 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 bye, -bye.